Uh, for those that are just visiting with us today, it's great, great to have you. And if you're new, please feel free to swing by the information kiosk right after the service and you can uh, grab a, a welcome packet there. There's a small, very small gift in there for you and uh, information about Journey and who we are and what we're, what we're about. If this is your first study in a few weeks, uh, we've begun a new series called Flesh. And it's uh, the tagline underneath it is uh, bringing the incarnation down. Uh, and learning how to be human like Jesus was human. I want you to just kind of let that sink in. Learning how to be human like Jesus is human. I hope you're kind of like me that you want to be a little bit more like him. Matter of fact, I would be okay to be a lot more like him. I often look in the mirror and go, what were, who are you, what are you doing? Have you ever had one of those weeks that you just had moments, days, maybe at full seven days of just, Wow. Your attitude just really stinks. Don't talk about your spouse or your kids. Just me. That's who I was. Uh, this, this word called incarnation, uh, we used, started with it last week, and it's the idea of taking on flesh. And we started with this verse of Scripture. We're going to read it again. First, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then this is kind of part of the, what we talked about last week, the why. And we have seen His glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We got a really good glimpse of what God is like. If you're wondering, what's God like? I wish I knew. Well, I encourage you to read the Word of God, the Bible, and just listen to the stories of Jesus and go, that's what God is like. That's who He's like. And we're going to do that a little bit more today. We kind of asked the question, why the incarnation last week? Why would God do this? Why would God come, become one of us, bring heaven down to us? All that kind of terminology that we talked about last week. And the, we kind of started off with this idea that God wants it all back. He wants it all back. It, it started out that creation was good. Matter of fact, he said it was very good. And he's talking about us. And relationships were a part of that. Our interaction with God, but also our interaction with one another, the physical creation was good the relational creation was good and then it got ruined and why Jesus came the incarnation is to get it all back not just so that I would say some quick words of oh God please forgive me of my sin and then live on my merrily way but that my life would begin to be a part of that part of the kingdom of God that is getting it all back to where I can look at it and God can look at it and say man that is good just a real simple question. How many of you would like your life to be described that way? That it was good. Matter of fact, God look at it and go, it was very good. The way you lived with your kids was very good. The way you lived with your spouse was very good. The way you worked with, at work, the way you dealt with fellow employees. And he would look at all of it and say, that's ah, very good. And that's where we're going to be heading. We finished up last week with this idea that God is pursuing you. That God is not waiting in the, you know, somewhere, hoping that someday you'll turn around, but being kind of refusing to make the first step, just the opposite. The incarnation is God's first step towards us. God is pursuing us. But not only is He pursuing us, He's also pursuing every other person, too. God has the capacity to do that. That He doesn't have a limit, lo, limited love, but He has immense love that can pursue everyone. And that everybody that you know, everyone at work, everyone at school, Everyone in your home, everyone in your neighborhood, everyone that you know, even the ones you don't, the ones that you like, and the ones you don't, God is pursuing them. And it's just a great, we used it last week, God is pursuing the guy who's a crazy guy when he drives, you know, and just drives you nuts. You think, what are you doing, moron? God's after him spiritually, wants to know him, wants to get to know him. Well, that leads us to a question then, how did Jesus do this when it was on this earth? So we're going to kind of pick up the, the, the quest there to learn more about God. And this is going to take us to John chapter 1, verse 43, where Jesus begins to pursue some guys. And how does he go about doing that? And we're going to kind of just take little pieces of this story of Jesus as we go. And uh, this is one of the first disciples, John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Was, follow me. I, I want you to just kind of get the grasp of that. There was no big persuasion thing. There was no kind of arm twisting. It is just invitational. 
One of the things you're going to find out as we kind of go through this whole series is God is all about invitation. He is inviting people into a relationship with Him. Yeah, He's making the first step. He's the one reaching out going, hey, let's get to know one another. He is invitational. He does that here with Philip, and somehow that works for Philip. Matter of fact, Philip goes on to say, and when he's talking about Jesus in the next couple of verses, he says, he's the one. <laughs> now, the problem for Philip, he has no idea what all that means. He doesn't understand the fullness of who Jesus is, and he doesn't know what he's going to go through in the next three years of his life as he becomes one of the followers of Jesus and walks around with Jesus and ultimately sees the cross sees the crucifixion, experiences the resurrection. He doesn't know any of that, but he knows this. He's the one. He doesn't understand all what that even means. But he gets, begins to put his faith in Jesus. He's the one. Today, you may be going, I really don't understand all this Christianity thing. You don't really have to. The first step is just this simple step of, he's the one. Jesus is the one. He's going to help me sort it out. He's going to help me figure it out. Some of them may understand a lot more than I do today. I know I hope to. But this is the first step. He is the one. Well, uh, Philip goes off and gets a friend. He finds his friend named Nathaniel. And we get kind of a, another person that Jesus is pursuing. And uh, he goes after Nathaniel. Nathaniel's a skeptic. Nathaniel's not... Uh, He's not as easily moved. In John chapter 1, verse 46 through 48, we kind of get the story of Nathaniel, who ends up being one of Jesus' 12 followers as well. Nathaniel said to him, as speaking to his friend Philip, um, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's kind of his, his skepticism. He heard he was from Nazareth, and he's kind of like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not how it's going to work. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit or guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. <laughs> Whoa, what was that about? What a crazy little interaction. But it shows that Jesus is interacting with Nathanael in a very unique way that connects with him. We find Nathaniel's response in the very next verse. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi. Boy, that's, he's taking a big jump already from nothing good comes from Nazareth to Rabbi. You are the son of God. Whoa, he's really moving quick in his faith. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. You ask the question, well, what took place in this interaction? I just kind of want to share a little bit of kind of the interaction, the nuances that are going on to help us understand about how Jesus pursues people. First of all, under the fig tree could be literal, that he was actually sitting under a fig tree and Jesus knew he was, and that kind of spooked him a little bit that he was under the fig tree. There's also the idea, uh, the possibility that under the fig tree was kind of a, a statement that meant you were studying the law, you were contemplating the law. That's often where men would go and do this. And so there could be that it's all both figurative and literal or that it's one or the other. Somehow this interaction takes place. There's no doubt Nathaniel was contemplating the Old Testament law and particularly a particular story of the Old Testament law because Jesus goes right to the heart. He says these words, he says, An Israelite in whom there is no guile or no deceit, which is a, a drawback to an Old Testament story. The story is the person of the name, by the name of Jacob. Jacob was the guy whose name gets changed to Israel. His name was Jacob, which basically means trickster or guile. And so Jesus draws out what was going on in, in Nathaniel's mind in his little statement. An Israelite, name changed from Jacob. An Israelite whom there is no guile. And all of a sudden, it kind of helps Nathaniel understand that not only did Jesus maybe know where he was geographically, he knew what he was contemplating. You ever have one of those freaky moments when someone reads your mind and it's really like, whoa, that really, I don't like that. That's kind of scary, right? And they actually get it right, just something in your eyes or something. And that's what happens here. How do you know me means more than how do you know my life and know that I have no guile. How do you know what was going on in the inner parts of me? You're creeping me out. No one goes there. 
but God. And all of a sudden, he realizes who he is. In a few minutes, Jesus is going to make a, another part of the story about uh, the stairway of heaven of angels ascending and descending. And it's still another story of the person of Jacob who becomes Israel. Matter of fact, it's when his name gets changed. He has this encounter with God and he names the place Bethel. And there's a lot of nuances here, but here's the whole point. He wrestles, Jacob wrestles with God and he changes his name from Guile. He gets rid of his name Trickster. And Nathan was contemplating that. And all of a sudden, Jesus brings it out. Jesus' call to Nathaniel isn't random. It's not some kind of one kind of call for everybody. Jesus had been formulating a plan to reach into the life of this great guy. Because he was a guy of honesty and integrity and didn't have guile in his heart. He wasn't like Jacob. Matter of fact, he looked just the opposite. He was Jacob when he became Israel after God had rooted it all out of him. And apparently God was already doing that in, in Nathaniel's life. The reality for each and every one of us, and listen to me really carefully on this, every person you know, God is doing something unique for them to draw them to himself. He cares that much about every human being. Not everyone will say yes. Matter of fact, most don't. However, there is a call going out from God, and this call is unique, calling them to come to relationship with Him. This call that God gives, uh, that Jesus gives here to Philip and Nathaniel, isn't just a one moment call. And sometimes we think about that and we think, okay, it's kind of a call to repentance. And that is definitely part of the call, but that's not it. And sometimes we just kind of think, well, that's the it. And I say these some magic words and I'm kind of done. The call of Christ is ongoing, never ending in your life. It's not a one time thing, it's an ongoing thing. It's kind of almost like a, a moment by moment, follow me. Let's take another step together. Let's stay in relationship with one another. Hey, move away from that and follow over here. It's a call. This call is life-encompassing. It covers everything that's in our life. Sometimes we use the word calling in Christian circles, and, and we kind of refer to that to being our ministry or what we do. Once again, it is just part of the call. We're not called to sit down and do nothing. No, we're called to do something great with God, and we're going to talk about that with Nathaniel here in a few minutes. So that maybe raises a question. Maybe you didn't know that you have a calling. If you have become one of those people who said, you know what, yes to Jesus. I want to be one of your followers. I want to share with you that you have a calling. And some of us have different callings in certain areas. There's no doubt that when Nathaniel was in this moment, he didn't know that Christ was going to call him to be one of his apostles. Very few people have ever had that calling. But he was going to call him to be one of the apostles. He didn't know that, but it was part of his call. Each one of us in this room are called at some point in time if you've accepted Christ. But there is a calling that all of us share as well, and I want to share that one with you today. Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to listen really carefully to this because you may not have really thought this through in your spiritual journey yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. He starts off, all this is through, from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He's speaking of those who have been come to know Jesus and been reconciled in our relationship with him. He's now given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. This has a lot to do with the whole incarnational view of Christ and what he's doing. I want to kind of get it in where, what he's going with this. He's talking about the, in this verse that anyone who has experienced the reconciliation of Christ, who's accepted him in their life, now has been given this call to reconciliation. They've been given the call to reconcile things back to the way they're supposed to be. Ba basically, move things back to where we're looking at it, saying, oh, that's good. Matter of fact, no, that's very good. That's the ministry that we're all called to. As a matter of fact, he uses a term that we're all here ambassadors to do that. Everyone in this room that has accepted Jesus 
has this call on their life. You are called as an ambassador of reconciliation. Much like today in the ancient world, and the, the time that this was written, ambassadors were representatives usually of kings, not governments now like today. But they were representatives of king and they had great purpose in their life. The purpose of an ambassador was to go primarily and establish goodwill with other nations or other groups of people to develop friendships for the king and alliances to make his kingdom strong. Think that through. There's a reason he chose this term. And that's exactly what has taken place in our lives now that we have experienced reconciliation from God. We are now ambassadors of reconciliation. There is a definition that I love about this, this view of reconciliation. That is not just getting people to the point where they say yes to Jesus, evangelism, even though that is an important part of the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation goes way beyond that. To everywhere I go, I am bringing the kingdom of Christ with me. In the midst of chaos, I am supposed to bring love and gentleness. Wherever I go, I'm supposed to represent my king with who he is and his personality and his nature is supposed to come through in the way I share my life with people. Where there is a lack of love, I am supposed to fill that deficit. Where there is a lack of God's presence, I'm supposed to fill that deficit. This is what we are called to be all the time. Now, if I were to say, hey, when's church? What do we think about? What would you answer? When's church? Sunday mornings at 8. Thank you for those who set up. Thank you very much. Uh, Sunday morning at 8 o'clock and then 10 for some. Uh, and that's what we think about because that's what we've been wired to for a long period of time. I want you to begin to think about this a little bit differently this morning. I want to think about kind of two ways the, the church experiences itself. First of all, it's been called the church gathered. That's what we're doing right now. The church gathered together. This is a wonderful expression of the church. It is a necessary expression of the church. Matter of fact, the book of Hebrews, dealing with uh, this, this question of should the church gather, says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, speaking of the end of time. In other words, this verse of Scripture talks about, yeah, the church does need to gather together. It even gives the purpose of why, to stir up one another to love and good works. It's not just about, I, I, I'm here at church because I need to be. I feel guilty if I don't. Parents are upset if I don't show up. The reality is I am here to give as much as I am to receive. I'm here to give and, and stir up and encourage each person around me that together we would stir up love about Christ and talk about Christ and encourage one another in the faith. And this is the church gathered. However, our calling as ambassadors doesn't happen here, not in this environment. It's the different environment, the sent environment, where it's been called in theology the, the church scattered. It's still church, but it's just scattered. And if I could with you for a moment, I'd like for you to kind of take a mental picture of Collingwood as you see it in the surrounding area, as many as are from the surrounding area. On Sunday morning, the church gathers to this location and several other locations in our community. And the church is in these hubs to encourage one another and, 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 and find grace and, and build one another up. But there's a purpose. It's so that as we leave, that we scatter and we infiltrate every part of our society, every neighborhood, every school, every workplace, that all of a sudden ambassadors are being sent out into to different lands to do the work of Christ that can't be done while we're here. This is important. It is part of what Christ wants. But the scattering of the church every day 
into the workplace, the neighborhoods, the schools, bringing about reconciliation. Many of us now are complaining about our world. It's just an angry place. Do you know who Christ has sent in to build up the, the deficit of love in our world? That would be us. So when you head off out of this place and you're heading towards home thinking, church is done. No, it's not. It's just getting started. I'm going to my place, my neighborhood. Tomorrow, maybe you'll head off to work. And as you're going, I want you to get it in your mind. I'm going to my mission field. What am I doing? I am bringing back a, a message of reconciliation. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. God loves all of us. He wants a relationship with all of us. He wants to express goodwill to people, not anger with mankind. Can you just see the scattering of us as we leave here? I want you to think about how broad this is. It's crazy. Do you know what we represent here? Far into the beach, way past Wasega Beach, way past Glen Huron, way past Thornberry, and all across this community. If we include workplaces, our reach goes all the way into Toronto and other parts of Ontario, and we actually have places around the world that we're deeply invested. Ambassadors for Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the church? But it only works as if actually you are an ambassador where you are. Well, we represent him, and because of that, we should reflect his kingdom. Ambassadors, when they went, they went reflecting the power, the strength of their king. The book that we've been reading, this book called Flesh, that, that some of you have been reading, he had some really interesting points, and just a couple I want to pull out. In the world that we live in, there's several things that are really important that we need to be thinking about as ambassadors for Jesus. First one is this one, being present with people instead of being preoccupied. You talk about something that the ambassadors of Jesus should be thinking about and doing, can you imagine what it looks like when somebody says, oh, I just need to talk to somebody, and somebody at work goes, okay, I've got time. You have time? Sure. Aren't you too busy to help me? No. No, God gave me enough time to do everything I need to do today. You must be on the list. Can you imagine what that would look like? Instead of this or being preoccupied and too busy to help anybody. In our world today, there is just kind of a busy chaos, isn't there? Admit it. That's how we, most people are living, just busy chaos. And in the middle of that, God wants to be able to look down and say, no, 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 it's changed, it's very good. When people have time to be present with people instead of too preoccupied. Another one that he wrote that was really good is this one, that we need to be relational versus transactional. What it meant by that, it, that we have become to view relationships as transactions. There are things that we do to get something out of it. We complete a transaction. Sometimes business, there's no way around that. Just meeting a guy, got to get the work done, whatever. However, even in the middle of that, there's relationship. Ambassadors of Jesus are about relationship, not transactions with people. Matter of fact, if you think about it, the transaction kind of view of the world is, look, we're relating right now because I need you to do this for me, and I need you to sign that so I make money, so this is a transaction. Let's get it happening here. Let's move on. I want to move to the next transaction. You know what that's called? That's called guile. That's called treachery. That's not real relationship. That is using other human beings. Ambassadors of Jesus don't do that. We don't reflect the king when we do that. Christ's ambassadors reflect the very character of Jesus himself. Why did Jesus look at this guy and Nathaniel go, in him there was no guile? I want to ask you today, that's what ambassadors look like. Is that what we look like? Ambassadors had this one last thing that's probably the most powerful thing that we're going to say today, very quickly, Acts chapter 3. Verse 6. 
This is the story after the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples were out kind of sharing the good news, and there's a person that needs healing. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. Listen to these words. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, this man whom you see. Uh, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. By faith, speaking later when he was asked about it, by faith in, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you all can see. The interesting thing is we go out as ambassadors. I'm not really going for me. Matter of fact, it's not about me. My life with my neighbors, my life at work, my life at home, my life when I'm volunteering, my life wherever, is no longer, if I am ambassador, I am about representing someone, not about me. However, the, the flip side of that is I get to come in His name. There was a kind of a law, it's still a part of our society today, and particularly in Roman law, that ambassadors, no matter what was going on, no matter what was happening in the war, ambassadors had free reign to move back and forth through enemy lines, to take messages of peace. Here's the reality. If you hurt a Roman ambassador, the legions came right behind, the Roman legions were right behind them to make sure that you paid a heavy penalty for hurting any of their ambassadors. Why? Because they carried the name, the powerful name of Rome. And this is what Paul is trying to get to here, that we come not in our name and our goodness and who we are, we're coming in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you kind of thought that through, but for the last 2,000 years, it is the most powerful name known to any human being in numbers, the number of people who call on his name, the number of people who've prayed to his name, the number of wonderful things that have been done in his name. I know people tend to look at the bad, but the, the, the wonderful things that have been done in the name of Jesus far outweigh any other name. We come in his name when we go into our schools, our homes, our neighborhoods. It's about his authority, about his name. Well, back to Nathaniel. The last thing that Jesus said to him was this, as they're having their interaction. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And once again, this is an image back to the Old Testament Jacob, who's having this, this vision at night where he saw this stairs, ladder thing happening, and angels going up and back and forth between heaven and earth. And he called it the gateway to heaven. And Jesus says this to Nathaniel. He said, listen what he says. He says, you will see the heavens open. In other words, that same experience that you were thinking about earlier under the fig tree, that thing that you were thinking about, about Jacob, and how he saw this ladder that allowed heaven and earth to interact with one another, and you saw the power and authority of heaven coming to earth, you're going to see that ascending on the Son of Man himself. Jesus is saying, I'm the guy, I'm the one who's going to make that incredible connection between heaven and earth. The name Son of Man actually has a lot of connection to the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, that he is the one that in the end makes everything right and puts everything back in order. So there's a lot of allusions to that. It's very good. This is what it is. We're his ambassadors using his powerful name, not as some kind of magical potion that I just say the words magically and things happen. No, I come as his representative to do his bidding and his message of reconciliation. This morning we have a person by the name of Jesus who has a great name. We're going to sing this song again that we just ended worship with just a second ago. I know it was new. We actually wanted to sing it for you, let you hear the words of it. Over and over again, this song talks about the beautiful name of Christ, the wonderful name of Christ, the powerful name of Jesus Christ. For you personally today, you may need something in your life, that powerful name, to come through for you. Healing, release from depression, struggles financially, 
hardships, relationships that are just not going the way it wants, and why God may not be able to fix the relationship, He can fix you, your half of it. So there may be something in your life right now that you need that powerful name. However, it may be just beyond that. It may be something in your neighborhood that your friends, your neighbors, people at school, people at work need to hear the message of reconciliation. And today I want you just to begin to think about, God, how can I affect that? What can I do? How can I be an ambassador for you? Next couple weeks we're going to continue to talk about how do I do that? and become an ambassador for Christ and represent His powerful name well. Let's worship.